Hi comrades, here's what's bothering me today. I'm your guest host Bothered Boy for this episode, and what's bothering me today is that unfortunately it seems like every day there is some kind of terrible, awful, just outright depressing news that's going on somewhere in the world, but unfortunately there's also a lot of good news that isn't always reported on, and I think that's something that more of us should focus on and take to heart and realize that we can and absolutely are winning around the world. So without further ado, let's begin. In New York City, Workers World Party members joined Palestinian-led organizations including Within Our Lifetime, Semidun Palestinian Prisoner Solidarity Network, the Palestinian Youth Movement, and Existence is Resistance in a pro-Palestine demonstration in response to the three-day bombing campaign waged by Israel against occupied Gaza in which 43 civilians were killed. The supporters were met with applause, cheers, and honking from passers-by as they occupied the steps of the IDF office, Grand Central Station, the Egyptian Consulate, Mayor Eric Adams International Affairs Office, and the United Nations headquarters for nearly three hours. A group of pro-Israeli Zionists who tried to disrupt the rally were far outnumbered by the thousands of supporters of Palestine chanting, Palestine will be free from the river to the sea within our lifetime. Moroccan human rights activists and civil society members protested the visit of the Israeli military chief of staff Aviv Kochabi. Groups of protesters, led by the National Action Group for Palestine, staged a demonstration outside of the parliament building in Rabat, denouncing the country's decision to welcome the military leader. In a statement, the group declared that the day of Kohavi's visit is a disgrace, shame, and calamity, which is recorded with ink of insult to the history of Morocco and betrayal of the positions of the Moroccan people, and referred to the visit as the institutionalization of Zionism. Morocco and Israel established full diplomatic relations in December 2020, in a deal facilitated by the United States under the Abraham Accords. The deal also provided U.S. recognition for Moroccan control over the Western Sahara, a disputed region which the Moroccan military occupies while suppressing the Sahrawi people who demand independence. Solidarity to our Moroccan comrades as they fight against these imperialist forces. The Rappahannock tribe has won back 465 acres of land after over 400 years of fighting for its return after their colonization and displacement by the English led by John Smith in 1608. For the tribe, the land is sacred and has great cultural and historical significance. It is special to us because the bones of our ancestors are there, said Rappahannock chief Anne Richardson. The return of this land is momentous for the tribe. Land back here and everywhere. After almost a month of national strikes, nationwide demonstrations, and roadblocks against the high cost of living, Panamanian people's movements have succeeded in convincing the right-wing government to reduce the cost of essentials, such as food and hygiene products, by 30%, increase the public education budget to 6% of the GDP, and put a price cap on 150 medicines. These major wins came even though the mass protests were met with violent repression in the streets and demonization in the mainstream media. In addition to increasing the education budget, the government also promised to close the 1,200 quote, ranch, end quote, schools, which are underfunded rural schools that consist of improvised open-air structures and to improve the conditions of existing schools in rural areas. In total, the teachers' associations won 22 agreements. The representatives of the unions and the government agreed to establish a subsequent process to monitor compliance with the agreements. Despite their successes, the People's Movement refuses to be appeased until all of their demands are met. Other demands include reducing and freezing the price of electricity, measures to combat corruption, evaluation of the crisis of the Social Security Fund, and the establishment of an official instance to monitor the compliance of the agreements with all sectors. Saul Mendez, General Secretary of the Single Union of Construction Workers, stated, we have managed to get the government to reduce and freeze the price of more than 70 items. There are points on which there is no consensus and which we will continue to debate. Congratulations to the Panamanian people who have held strong. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. The people united will never be defeated. On Wednesday, the 25th of July, Lufthansa ground staff went on strike throughout Germany, leading to over 1,000 flight cancellations. 
The labor union Verdi called for the walkout, hoping to see a significant pay increase for about 20,000 workers. Lufthansa reduced its staffing during the coronavirus crisis despite being saved by the taxpayer, and now there are personnel shortages in all corners, said Verdi representative Marvin Ruchinsky. We now need financial investments in personnel to make sure air travel is still possible in the future. A week after the strike, the dispute ended after Lufthansa agreed to increase basic monthly salaries for 20,000 Lufthansa ground staff by 2.5% from January 2023, and then again by another 2.5% on July 1st, 2023. Congratulations to the striking workers! Moving to another airline, thousands of British Airways staff have managed to secure a pay rise of 13% after their union Unite backed industrial action for check-in staff. Unite General Secretary Sharon Graham said, By standing strong with Unite, our members have compelled BA to table a pay rise that goes towards compensating for the pay cuts suffered during the pandemic. There is still some way to go for workers at BA to trust this company again, given the hostile manner in which they conducted themselves during the pandemic. Once again, Unite's focus on improving jobs, pay, and conditions has delivered for our members. Fantastic work! Amid a major economic crisis, the Ghanaian people have been mobilizing and protesting against rampant inflation. Meanwhile, the government of Ghana has initiated discussions with the International Monetary Fund for a potential bailout program. This would be the 18th IMF program in Ghana, and the Socialist Movement of Ghana, or the SMG, has vehemently rejected further IMF intervention, arguing that this would do nothing to alleviate the structural problems in the economy. A statement by the movement read, The crisis the Ghanaian economy has been plunged into is only a symptom of the collapse of the neoliberal order which has been diligently enforced by the IMF, the World Bank, the centers of power in the colonial metropolis, and neocolonial regimes spread across Africa, Asia, South America, and elsewhere. Dang, if that ain't the truth. In another statement, the SMG wrote that there is no evidence that any country anywhere in the world has managed to improve its economic fortunes as a result of the implementation of measures under the marching orders of the Bretton Woods institutions. Instead, the SMG has argued that to solve Ghana's economic crisis and dependence on foreign institutions, they must have a fundamental restructuring of the economy underpinned by socialist transformation. We need to focus on building an economy in which the resources of Ghana are owned by its people and are exploited for their own benefit. Solidarity with our Ghanaian comrades! University and college union-led negotiations with the Open University culminated in a major victory for around 4,800 university workers. From August 1st, 2022, the staff will benefit from increased job security, a pay upgrade between 10 to 15 percent, extra annual leave, and staff development allowances. The UCU has also called for an end of casual contracts, putting in their place permanent contracts and full rights for academics. This marks the biggest decasualization success in the UK in the entire history of higher education. UCU General Secretary Joe Grady said the new contract is life-changing for the 4,800 associate lecturers who have been moved onto secure contracts that mean they no longer have to constantly reapply for their jobs. UCU is immensely proud of reaching this agreement with the Open University after many years of hard work, and while we recognize there is still more to do, we are celebrating this huge step forward in ending casualization at the OU. The 2.1 million member California Labor Federation began its biennial convention in July with a meeting featuring Chris Smalls from the Amazon Labor Union. Smalls discussed how to organize the unorganized, sharing a hopeful message about how, in the U.S., we have witnessed the most exciting year labor seen in recent times, with mass organizing drives rising up throughout the nation. For Smalls, the union is our family. Over time, they see that. Over time, we show them in thousands of small meetings. They can see the power of the people when we come together. Chipotle has agreed to pay $20 million to roughly 13,000 workers in the largest fair workweek settlement in the U.S.'s history and the largest worker protection settlement in the history of New York City. The company was found to have violated the workers' rights to predictable schedules and paid sick leave. The settlement came after 160 Chipotle workers and the 32 BJ Service Employees International Union filed complaints against the company. The city's investigation found that Chipotle failed to give workers their schedules two weeks in advance, requiring them to work extra time without advance notice or consent, and failed to allow workers to use accrued sick days, among other labor violations. Great job to the workers and the union who fought for them. 
the Trader Joe's in Hadley, Massachusetts became the first location in America to unionize and shortly after, workers at a Trader Joe's in Minneapolis voted to unionize in a landslide vote of 55 to 5. Despite the company's best efforts to bust organizing efforts, workers overwhelmingly supported forming unions. Now, the hard work of advocating on behalf of the workers and negotiating with the employer begins in an effort to secure a contract that will benefit the crew. Trader Joe's and all companies should be grateful to have workers in the first place. Without the workers, how could the bosses make a living? There seems to be no stopping unionization in the U.S. as workers across the country are finally realizing their collective power and standing up for themselves. Expect more Trader Joe's to follow suit. So remember how Colombia got a new left-wing government a while back? Well, under Colombia's new left-wing government, some big changes are underway. Colombia's incoming foreign minister, Alvaro Leva, visited Venezuela on the 28th of July to meet with Venezuelan Chancellor Carlos Faria to plan resumption of relations. This marks the first visit from a Colombian official since the rupture of relations between the nations in 2019. In a statement, the Venezuelan foreign ministry said that the meeting between Leva and Faria took place in order to re-establish diplomatic relations between brother countries. Fantastic news as U.S. imperialism played a major role in destabilizing relations, using Colombia as a staging ground for their provocations in Venezuela. The Colombian government also announced that they will resume peace discussions with the National Liberation Army, the largest guerrilla group still active in the nation, to be mediated by Cuba, Ecuador, Chile, and Norway. The discussions were initially stunted in 2018 by the former right-wing president Ivan Duque, one of the most violent leaders in the country's history. But on the 8th of August, the head of state said, We wish to revitalize the protocols and in the coming weeks it will be announced whether we will maintain the dialogues in Cuba. It doesn't depend only on us, but on who wants to negotiate. And lastly, on Monday, July 25th, Colombia's Special Jurisdiction for Peace, the JEP, charged 22 former military officers, one state official, and two civilians with war crimes and crimes against humanity. Their crimes included killing 303 innocent people in 218 incidents between 2005 and 2008, and framing these victims as left-wing guerrilla fighters killed in combat. The military unit had a criminal structure that naturalized this violent practice to access promotions, cash prizes, vacations, and other perks. The JEP said in a statement, a complex criminal organization was implanted in the 16 Brigade that used the institutional architecture of the army to present murders and forced disappearances as combat casualties. It was a criminal plan that had its objectives, resources, roles, and modes of operation. It was aimed at consolidating territories and showing progress in the war against the guerrillas. Sheesh, with actions like that, the CIA would be proud. An important victory for RICES, the largest immigration legal services nonprofit based in the state of Texas in the United States, was won when the Biden administration announced its commitment to ending the anti-immigrant Trump-era Remain in Mexico policy. Though they still have a way to go to actually ending the policy, the administration's public statement is a notable milestone and accredited to the tireless work of the activists and advocates at RACES. In a statement by RACES, they said, Today marks a moment of optimism and hope that relief is near for migrants impacted by the Remain in Mexico policy still seeking safety at our southern border. In a huge win for the LGBTQ community in Vietnam, the health ministry released an official document that stated that homosexuality cannot be cured, does not need to be cured, and cannot be changed. It also urged medical professionals to be respectful of gender and sexual orientation after receiving reports of doctors claiming they could treat gender minorities. The document then explicitly stated, do not consider homosexuality, bisexuality, or being transgender a disease. Nguyen Thi Kim Jung, officer at Vietnam Center for Supporting Community Development Initiatives, said this document is an official acknowledgement to LGBT people that they have the right to go to medical establishments and that they have the right to be treated equally. Lawmakers in Greece voted to ban so-called sex normalization surgeries on intersex children. The bill will ban such procedures on children under 15 unless the court allows them. Doctors who perform the surgeries would face fines and prison. The procedures will be allowed for teenagers over 15 if they consent to them. 
Intersex Greece, an intersex advocacy group, in a press release notes Greece joins Germany, Iceland, Malta, and Portugal in enacting such legislation. Intersex Greece said, as of today, surgical and other medical interventions, which until now have been carried out on intersex infants and children, secretly and without consent, to conform their sex characteristics with the typical male or female anatomy, have been legally banned in Greece. Today is, therefore, historic for the protection and recognition of the human rights of intersex people in Greece, in Europe, and in the world. In the dumpster fire that is abortion rights in the United States, a spark of hope was found when voters in Kansas rejected an amendment that would have allowed the state legislature to ban the procedure. The vote, which came just six weeks after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, means Kansas will remain one of the few red states where abortion is widely accessible. It also provides hope to abortion rights supporters who are betting on ballot initiatives in other conservative states to restore or maintain access to the procedure. Well done, Kansas! In more hopeful news for reproductive rights in the U.S., the Atlanta City Council approved $300,000 of funding to access for Reproductive Care Southeast, a reproductive rights organization that provides financial and educational resources for people seeking abortions. If anyone says this is unprecedented, I would tell them it is. These are unprecedented times, said District 5 Councilmember Liliana Bakhtiari, who introduced the legislation. People in elected positions like mine need to go above and beyond to ensure that lives are saved because people People are going to die. Shout out to local officials fighting the good fight. A victory against rape culture has been won in Canada as the Supreme Court ruled in a 5-4 vote that stealthing is by law sexual assault. Stealthing is a practice by which a person either removes their condom during sex or pretends to be wearing one when they are not without their sexual partner's knowledge. The Supreme Court ruled that condom use is now considered a condition of consent under the law and that changing sex from protected to unprotected constitutes a different type of sex than what was consented to, thus making it sexual assault. Though this should have always been the law, sadly, stealthing has been historically dismissed by courts and judges as sex that was consented to and therefore not illegal. This can also include cases where the perpetrator wore a condom but sabotaged it with the intent of impregnating or infecting their sexual partner. This ruling is a significant step towards a better public and systemic understanding of sexual violence under the patriarchy and a crushing blow to the manosphere. Fuck. The. Patriarchy. Scotland is the first country in history to legally protect menstruating people's right to access free period products. The so-called Period Products Act comes into effect from the 22nd of August. Councils and education providers across Scotland will now be legally required to equip all those that need them with free sanitary products. Labour MSP Monica Lennon told the BBC, This is another big milestone for period dignity campaigners and grassroots movements which shows the difference that progressive and bold political choices can make. The St. Kitts and Nevis Labour Party have won the general elections and will now occupy six seats out of the 11 in the National Assembly. Dr. Terence Drew, a Cuban-trained medical practitioner, will be the next Prime Minister. The SKNLP campaigned on the need to liberate the country from the clutches of the Coalition Team Unity government and presented strong, worker-centered policies. The SKNLP stated, for too long, we have all suffered as a people and as a country. It is time for our lives to be improved. It is time for hashtag better. Former President of Brazil, Lula da Silva, is now officially the Workers' Party candidate, as well as the candidate of the federation named Brazil of Hope, which combines three parties. The Workers' Party, the Communist Party of Brazil, and the Green Party. According to polls, Lula has a large lead over Bolsonaro, who is seeking re-election. Since the beginning of the year, Lula has been building a broad alliance with seven other parties called Let's Go Together for Brazil to defeat Bolsonaro. This will be Lula's seventh presidential campaign and a third term in office, which would be an unprecedented feat in Brazil. In 2018, Lula was leading the polls until he was arrested as a result of illegal maneuvers by a court judge. After being imprisoned for 580 days between April 7th, 2018 and November 8th, 2019, he is now finally free to run for the presidency. Here's hoping that South American leftist pink wave crashes into Brasilia. 
Australia's UNESCO World Heritage listed Great Barrier Reef has suffered from widespread damage due to climate change. However, monitoring groups reported that whilst the southern part of the reef is still experiencing severe loss, two-thirds of the reef, the northern and central parts, have recorded the highest amount of coral cover in nearly four decades. The report stated that two-thirds of the hard coral reef have reached 33% and 36% this year, the highest level recorded in the past 36 years of monitoring. There are still a ways to go to protect this and other coral reefs and ocean life, but this is super heartening news. And lastly, this summer has seen a historic number of great white shark sightings and encounters along U.S. coasts. While great whites in other parts of the world are still struggling, researchers are fairly confident that great white populations are increasing in U.S. waters. Populations of the species around North America have grown steadily in the past three decades thanks to federal and state laws preventing people from killing them or catching them accidentally and protecting their prey, such as seals. Carly Jackson, a shark researcher and the Director of Communications for Minorities and Shark Sciences, said sharks have been around for 450 million years, before trees existed. If humans aren't killing them or their prey, it's amazing how resilient they are. Comrades, if you have good news from the current month, please send your stories to totalliberationpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you to Javi for the positive news jams. Thank you to Cosmo for the positive news background. Thank you to Nick, Catherine, Mexi, and Ash for script writing and production. And thank you to JC for editing this video. And of course, shout out to yours truly for hosting, and thank you all for having me on the program. We are trying to expand our team and also our Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show, please go to patreon.com slash positive leftist news or you can give us a one-time tip the link is in the description box below and finally i'm bothered that this channel and all these fine people aren't even bigger and more well known so please like and share the video okay there we go that's what's bothering me today